Android Dialogues, where we have bite-sized conversations with people in the Android community. I'm Huynh Thuyet Dao, and I'm speaking with... Dan Kim. And we're currently in the Big Apple, New York City, for DroidCon New York, where both Dan and I are speaking. Uh, Dan, uh, where are you based, and how did you get started in Android? Yeah, uh, I'm based in Chicago, and I work at a company called Basecamp, and that's actually how I got started. I'd, write, I'd been writing Java apps for... Well, over a decade, probably, mm -hmm. server-side web apps. And uh, when I got to Basecamp, I'd been doing kind of a bunch of different things for a little bit. And uh, I think it was the middle or end of uh, 2014 mm -hmm. where we kind of needed somebody to take over our uh, Android app. Yeah. And so I did. I took over the Basecamp 2 uh, Android app, and then uh, we spun up a new app called Basecamp 3. Mm -hmm. And then uh, <laughs> we've uh, been working on that ever since. So that's kind of how I fell into it. Both Dan and I are talking this week about a subject that um, I know is close to your heart and mm -hmm. been be getting very close to mine, and that is Kotlin. And uh, like Dan, I, I've, re I've read like a lot of awesome uh, posts about Kotlin, and I've heard you on like like the Fragmented podcast. So mm -hmm. you seem like a really big fan of Kotlin. It's been a life changing thing. It's just uh, so nice to write, and so clear and readable mm -hmm. and easy, and it has so many conveniences built into it that um, you know all the things you could do in Java, but just were a little bit harder. Yeah. And so those things, it's really the first time that I felt really genuinely excited to work with a programming language, which is odd right like java was always <laughs> just sort of a a tool to me and it's just yeah. kind of a, a thing to to get get me where i needed to be mm -hmm. um but Khan has been really really nice to work with and uh, very exciting so like i when i first started my first language was c c plus plus and then when i moved to java i noticed that in order for like kind of as i was learning java i would first do things in a very c plus plus way mm -hmm. And then learn the Java way of doing things, and I feel like I'm doing the same thing with Kotlin. But I I want to get to that point where I write idiomatic Kotlin because mm -hmm. that seems like the the kind of like you will hear that term yes, a lot, a lot, a lot. You will hear that a lot. There's good reason for that. Those mm -hmm. idioms are very important and sort of really good best practices sort of things. Right. The natural way of writing Kotlin, mm -hmm. and yeah, you don't want to necessarily carry over all your Java style over to Kotlin. Yeah. But I would also say that it's not the worst thing in the world to sort of write. Java Kotlin. Okay. You do want to learn, you obviously do want to learn the idioms and they're really, really important and good, mm -hmm. but you don't want to get like hung up on it. The idioms page on the Kotlin documentation mm -hmm. is an excellent sort of reference to show you all the different things you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the basics are that if there seems like there should be a simpler, nicer way to write something in Kotlin, there probably is. A lot of times things like um, collection support in Kotlin is very yes. nice, and so when you want to loop through something simple, like if you just want to write a loop, the collection support in Kotlin is just much nicer, and the extensions that they provide just kind of let you do things in a really, really nice way. Mm -hmm. Just doing things like conditionals, like going through like an if-else block or whatever, you can do things in Kotlin that are just much nicer, like with a when block. And so mm -hmm. there's all these little things that sort of the sum of its parts, uh, the the whole is sort of greater than the sum of its parts, right? You start to do all these little things over time, mm -hmm. and they, they build up into this sort of um, much nicer thing. And so I think really the key is for people to learn maybe like two, three, four idioms that like really make sense to them, mm -hmm. that really click for them, and start to apply those sort of in your day-to-day -day, mm -hmm. day -day work, right? Find one or two things that kind of really click for you and start to use those over and over and over. And those will sort of start to expose you to um, how the language is constructed and just give you a sense of the philosophy behind the language. Mm -hmm. And once you start to get that, I think it really, everything else starts to start to fall in place, especially when you're just starting out. Within that first couple months or whatever, it's gonna take some time to like learn all the idioms mm -hmm. and you shouldn't rush through it. You just need a couple things that you just kind of latch onto and just apply those over and over and over and you'll really get a sense for, for what you're doing. And you mentioned like the idioms page on, uh, on yep. the Kotlin documentation, which are pretty good. Do you think that's a good laundry list, do you think? Maybe just to go from top bottom and just try a couple things every week? Or? It is, I think there's quite a bit. I kind of referenced that quite a bit um, when I was first starting off, just looking at that as sort of the menu of like, this is the way that you can write Kotlin. These are, mm -hmm. these are some preferred ways of writing Kotlin mm -hmm. uh, that you don't want to carry over necessarily your bad Java habits, if you will. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think that's a really nice place to start. There's also usually a ton of stuff that people are writing that are um, they're basically side-by-side -side guides. People mm -hmm. write those a lot, and there's um, all sorts of blog posts that show you sort of like, here's the Java version, and then here's exactly how you would write the same thing in Kotlin. Mm -hmm. um, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, so those are, good, those are good places to start. Do you have, do you remember like maybe when you were starting Kotlin, something that kind of blew your mind, like a, syn like a syntax or just a language feature that maybe something that was just like, oh, holy crap, we can't do this in Java. This is amazing. Like, do, you, do you remember kind of like something that maybe kind of spoke to you like that oh, when man, you first started? Oh man, there was so much. <laughs> uh, I think extension functions are probably oh. the thing that just sort of blew me away. There's mm -hmm. really no way to do that in Java. And if you don't know what extension functions are, they're basically uh, in a way to write 
a method on top of any object that you want, whether you own it or not. You don't mm -hmm. have to subclass it. You can just basically extend it. Um, so like if you wanted to do something on top of string, you could just make a method that's added to string. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really mind blowing in that regard. Like I could write this thing on top of anything that I don't own. And you can basically create any a API that you want, mm -hmm. right? On top of especially the Android APIs, if you don't like how something is constructed yeah. or <laughs> all the parameters that are passed into it, you can basically construct your own API mm -hmm. on top of anything. Um, and that was really helpful and really interesting because um, you could clean up quite a bit of code by just writing extension functions. It is kind of easy to get carried away with something like that. Like yes. I used to write a lot of extension functions and mm -hmm. then realize it was used in like one place. <laughs> yeah. So you could sort of uh, over optimize or optimize mm -hmm. too soon. Um, but extension functions, I think, were the big thing that really kind of caught my eye. That was yeah. like, wow, we can't, there's really no equivalent uh, to doing right. this. And I was wondering if there's anything kind of on the flip side, like, was there anything that other than extension functions that um, you, f you think that maybe people get excited about, but could probably pull back from as you're going to Kotlin. Like maybe things like as you mature in your Kotlin journey that maybe you grow, grow out of a little bit. Yeah, I, I think the, I, I can't think of anything specific, but I think the general idea is that yes, you can get uh, over enthusiastic sort mm -hmm. of. I certainly did. Like I had this weird thing where I just like really loved cutting lines. Like just if I could get, <laughs> if I could get a Java class and convert it and cut it down to mm -hmm. cut 90 lines off it, mm -hmm. I get super excited about that. And then I would use all of the things that Kotlin provided. It gives you all of these um, functions and extensions and tools. You can do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what ended up happening for me was that I was actually sacrificing clarity and readability just sort of to use the things that were given to right, me, like right. given all these tools that were um, just made available to me. And so Kotlin gives you a lot more flexibility and power and tools mm -hmm. than Java generally does. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can get yourself in, into trouble, especially as far as like code organization. You can put everything on the top level of, in a file yeah. if you want in mm -hmm. Colin. Uh, you can have package level functions. You can do all sorts of crazy, interesting things that, mm -hmm. that make the, the language really useful and powerful. But yeah, you can get in trouble too. Like you can have uh, a lot of mangled, disorganized code too. So uh, there is sort of a flip side to it. Um, you kind of want to watch. And you'll really only learn that over time with experience. Yeah. You kind of make a couple of mistakes and realize, oh, I can just simplify this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can definitely go overboard here and there. Yeah, I think one example for me is basically type inference. So mm -hmm. in Kotlin, the, the, the Kotlin compiler is actually pretty smart in that a lot, in a lot of occasions, it can actually infer the type of something, say a variable, uh, based on what, what's on the right-hand side. And so I know when I first started Kotlin, you know, I, a lot of times I would be pasting something from Java over to Kotlin and it would just infer all the types so that I would just have the variable name and nothing there. And mm -hmm. it was really cool and really brief. But after a while, especially when working with Android APIs, I'd sit there and like, oh, what? I don't remember what yeah. what that is. I don't know, like, and, you know, and I start to maybe like I had like maybe some Arcs Java going on or some other like chain methods, and I'm like, I'm not quite sure what this type is supposed to be anymore. Yep. And so I've actually personally kind of backed away from that. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not like an Android like type or just something that maybe I should know explicitly, um, if it gets confusing, I, I tend to put the types back in. Yep, yep, I've so. done that too. Uh, I've started to do that a little bit where, uh, especially on single line expression functions where, yes. right, it returns some, or it looks like a single line and it just has an equal and an expression and mm -hmm. you're not necessarily, you don't have to put a return type on it. It could just mm -hmm. be void or it could be returning. But if you just look at it as one line, it may or may not be returning anything and you don't necessarily pick that up quickly. When you're writing it, you're like, oh, I know exactly what this is doing. Mm -hmm. I don't need a return type here. but. Uh, if you explicitly say what it is, or you just break it out into not being a single line expression yeah. function, that's also an option. So there's there's stuff like that, like type inference is one of those things where you kind of feel like, I don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have to, I won't do it. And it's really nice and tidy. And then later when you come back, three, six months later, you're kind of like, I don't remember what this is anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, um, just to kind of extend from that, I know that um, at Basecamp, you are like 100% uh, Kotlin, yes, which are. is amazing. <laughs> and it seems like, you know, as we're talking, you know, there's a lot of things that, I guess there's a lot of decisions to make. As people are kind of bringing Kotlin into their teams and things like that, do you have any tips on, say, how to approach PR reviews or how to kind of, I guess, balance out or, or kind of organize the team as, you know, maybe some people are kind of like starting with Kotlin, some people more mm -hmm. advanced. Like, how do you... I guess, um, make sure that everyone kind of stays on the same page yep. as we're all learning everything. Um, I think it depends largely on your team structure and size and your app. So mm -hmm. it's, that's kind of a non-answer, but no, 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 <laughs> it depends is my favorite answer in the, on the planet. <laughs> um, but at Basecamp, like we're, we're just two programmers. It's just myself and Jay. Mm -hmm. And, um, so we can easily sort of, we're basically in tune, right? Mm -hmm. If I say, Hey, check this out. This is one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. We can talk about it right away. Versus a team of, say, five or 10 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily rely on 
coding standards or anything like that. We rely on just basic communication. Be like, hey, Jay, what do you think of this? Mm -hmm. Hey, Dan, what do you think of that? And then our pull request reviews. But if you are a team, a bigger team, especially a highly distributed team or um, on a big app, mm -hmm. I think it's not the worst idea to just maybe have very broad stroke coding standards, I mm -hmm. think. I'm not, again, at Basecamp, we don't have technically a lot of coding standards. Mm -hmm. but. Again, if you're a bigger team, I think it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to just think about how are you going to organize your constants? How are you going to organize your extension functions? Mm -hmm. uh, when is it appropriate to do this versus this, right? Mm -hmm. Just some broad, broad stroking, broad mm -hmm. strokes of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we don't have to deal with it. And I'm glad we don't have to deal with it. Uh, but I think it's definitely a legitimate concern. No, I think we've kind of done the same thing. We just kind of let it grow, grow organically. And mm -hmm. when something pops up, we'll just kind of hop into chat or whatever and have a conversation about it and try to come to... Uh, an agreement and then maybe six months later we'll discover something new about kotlin right and we're like all right well we can change our minds that's um, actually, actually a really good point because especially if you're all learning kotlin at basically the same rate or roughly the same rate mm -hmm. is that you are not you can come up with all the coding standards you want at the beginning <laughs> and they're very likely will go all out the window because what you know now versus six months from now versus mm -hmm. a year from now mm -hmm. it's going to be completely different right and how you decide to attack that is going to completely change mm -hmm. so kind of how you have it now is just really just a snapshot in time and it may not be what you want in, mm -hmm. in six months or a year anyway so yeah. you know take it with a grain of salt mm -hmm. i think again it depends on how big you are, how big your team is but um mm -hmm. yeah cool so um i guess to kind of wrap up um mm -hmm. let me ask you what's what kind of what, what's your favorite thing in kotlin right now like is there something in the last three months that you're like oh my gosh i'm like this is like the awesomest thing that I've, I've, I've learned recently in kotlin i have to i think go back to extension functions yeah um it's kind of a it was an early one mm -hmm. but it's still i think my favorite in that it just offers the most power and mm -hmm. cleanup and readability that generally speaking day-to-day -day stuff that's kind of the stuff that we use i also just again like i said earlier where the the whole language sort of all together as it works mm -hmm. there's a lot of little things about it like you said type inference mm -hmm. it's just really nice you just never have to declare you know object and then variable and then do it again mm -hmm. um just not having to write semicolons there's all sorts of like little stuff that when you you do all of it together is like where it really i feel like comes together mm -hmm. um so i call out extension functions because i think it's probably the biggest thing mm -hmm. the, the most important uh kind of oh wow thing yeah but I really do think that the language sort of in totality, all the things that it can kind of do together mm -hmm. is really what makes it special and makes it exciting to work with and interesting, uh, more so than I ever really felt with, with Java. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Thank you for um, having me. And you are talking this week at DroidCon New York. What is the title of your talk? Uh, Getting to 100% Kotlin, A Practical Guide. I like it. <laughs> uh, and in fact, I will definitely uh, be on the lookout for that, as should you. I believe DroidCon generally records all of the sessions, so mm -hmm. you should definitely check out Dan's talk. If people wanted to find you on the internet, how can they do that? Uh, they can find me on Twitter, at Dan Kim. And uh, I'm also happy to get emails, dan at basecamp.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. And thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.